Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro RPG. And you'll pardon my slightly husky voice this week as I'm recovering from a cold. The one the BBC's been describing as the worst cold ever. And I'm not really one to disagree with them. But at the end of another poll, we've got another clear winner. And the winner this week was the Last Command Source book for the Star Wars role-playing game. So we'll go over to that in a second, but as usual I'll be back at the end of the video with some other channel related things and stuff related to the poll. I'll see you there. So this is the Last Command Sourcebook. Now firstly I'll apologise for the dreadful lighting. It's dark here in Scotland, the daylight hours are drastically shrinking, so I'm having to use a lot of artificial lights. So we've got a bit of a shine here and a bit of shine here, which will only affect us on the shiny covers. So perhaps you can't see Jurist both here in all his glory, but it's quite a nice cover. Now flipping over to the back, um, Star Wars The New Republic, The Last Command Sourcebook by Eric Troutman. Finally, the stunning conclusion to Timothy Zahn's three book cycle is adapted for Star Wars The Role Playing Game. The New Republic faces a grave challenge from a reunited empire as the infamous Imperial Grand Admiral Thrawn takes the battle to Coruscant, the very heart of the New Republic. As Thrawn plans his final stunning campaign, the New Republic's bravest heroes race across Wayland in a desperate attempt to destroy the Emperor's cloning chambers at Mount Tantis. Learn the story behind the story of this climactic showdown between the Republic and the evil Galactic Empire. Return to the wonder and excitement of a far-off galaxy in this companion volume to Timothy Zahn's best-selling novel, The Last Command. This book com includes complete information and game statistics on all the characters, aliens, vehicles, droids, planets, and starships from this gripping adventure. The stunning conclusion. Now, it is a fantastic ending to the Throne trilogy. Last Command's really, really good. Um, it brings together plot threads split, uh, spread throughout the trilogy and really does tie things up nicely. This source book, not so great though, but it is decent. I'm not going to criticise it, but it is decent. So let's flick through it. Um, start off with the long time ago, A Galaxy Far, Far Away, and their version of the Star Wars scroll text there. And some nice artwork, the faded cover image. Um, and we're on to table of contents and introduction. And you can see the interior artwork is West End Games uh, quality of this period, which is very, very nice. It's not the most detailed or stunning artwork out there, but it really does sell Star Wars. I really do like it. So we've got introduction, talking about The Last Command and The Last Command source book, uh, detailing how they've gone. Um, the prologue, so the state of the galaxy, everything that's going on, bringing you up to date with what's happened in the prior two books and, of course, what happens in this book. And then we get straight into the detail of the New Republic. So we've got Luke Skywalker updated again. Now, that's been one of my criticisms always of the West End Games source books, that they just repeat over and over again the same stats. So how many times do we need to see Luke's stats? Perhaps a better way could have just updated them, but to give credit where credit is due, it does mean that if you're wanting details for characters who are in this book, they're in this book. You don't have to find, well, Luke Skywalker was detailed in the Return of the Jedi book, and he really hasn't improved much since then, so go look him up there. But we've got Luke Skywalker stats, Princess Leia Organa Solo, Han Solo, all the standard ones. Chewbacca and the Life Debt, talking through that. Chewbacca stats, Lando stats, R2-D2 stats, C-3PO. Then we've got Mon Mothma, General Gumbel Iblis, um, who was introduced in the last book. We've got Winter, who is Princess Leia's aide, essentially. Somebody who's a spy version of Princess Leia, pretty much. And we've got new characters, so Pash Kraken, the son of General Aaron Kraken. One of the major characters from the West End Games books. Uh, Colonel Jack Bremen. Lieutenant Kylan Dupre. Brendan, Wing Commander Diblin Harleys. Siantev, a, a Salastan there. Um, Councillor Santeb. Lieutenant Mitchell Kendi. Commander Seth Sesfan. Where's Jansen? And then we've got Lieutenant Derek Hobby Clivian, 
who I believe actually shows up in the Rebels series as well as obviously having been in the original uh, trilogy. Then we're on to the Forces of the Empire. So this is all fairly standard stuff. We've got Grand Admiral Thrawn again, detailing through him. And it goes into Delta Source. One of the big things in the novel is the fact that there's a leak within the New Republic. Um, Grand Admiral Thrawn knows what they're planning before they know. So they think there's a spy. So they start blaming all sorts of people. And it turns out that the plant life within the New Republic headquarters has been wired. So as sound hits it, it emits out electrical signals through the plants because they've been specially chosen. And those electrical signals are being monitored and sent on to Thrawn. So basically all the plants are listening in for him. While not being technological themselves, the uh, transmitters can be attached to their roots and put some distance away. But when they scan a room for bugs, there's nothing there. There's just the plants. It's quite an intelligent idea, but <clears throat> I'm not that keen on it. The idea that the plants were specially chosen to monitor people. Um, we've got Captain Gilliam, uh, Gilad Pillion, Joris Caboth there. New characters, Major Molo Himron, Fingal, oh, just so many, I can't even be bothered going through all their names. And then we're on to tactics and battles. So we're going through, because obviously Thrawn is supposed to be an absolute master tactician. So detailing the tactics that he uses, so a games master can... Uh, mutate them if he's using Thrawn as a villain. It's a really clever idea. So we go through the Siege of Coruscant, where basically he dumps cloaked asteroids in orbit around Coruscant. Ships will collide with some of the asteroids, and they have to lock down the planet, put up its force shields, because the asteroids will come smashing down to the surface, killing uh, thousands, even maybe millions. So he has isolated the world. Unfortunately, what they don't know is he's only put a dozen or so asteroids up there, not many. So they're not actually that under siege. <clears throat> We've got the Covert Shroud Gambit, which we'll see later on because Luke disguises his X-Wing by putting it in the cargo hold of a freighter. Uh, different formations, so the A-Wing Slash, detailing how that works. And then we're onto the fringe, because of course the Thrawn books use the fringe elements really, really strongly. So while the Rebel Alliance and the Empire are fighting, Han Solo has his links into the fringe elements, or the criminals, and can use a network of spies that neither side really has access to. So we've got Talon Card, Mara Jade, who later becomes Mara Jade Skywalker. Um and is the subject of The Last Command itself. A major spoiler for the book, uh, Mara Jade has been programmed by the Emperor with his Last Command in the moments while he was plummeting to his doom. He sent out a command through the Force to her, who he trained up as one of his Emperor's hands. And she must kill Luke Skywalker. It is programmed into her psyche. She must do that. Um... Fortunately, they happen to have an uh, extra uh, Luke Skywalker hanging around because he's been cloned from the hand that Luke lost on Bespin. So everything works out for the best. And uh, Niles Ferrier, a starship thief. Brask, Ghent. Lots of fairly interesting characters, and I would say far more interesting than a big list of Imperial officers and rebel officers which you're not really going to use that much. Maybe the Imperial officers as villains, but I don't really see the point in having loads of rebel officers when you're really going to use them in a game. Mazik, a smuggler. Shada. Kligon the Zebretha. Okay. Um, and then we're on to the planets. There's some interesting places. We go through Bespin. Um, Bilbringi, Chond, Chazwa, Dolomar. Um, Marist is quite an important planet within it. Ord Mantel, obviously where the Bad Batch is set, and I'll come back to the Bad Batch in a minute. Um, 
Odd Trassy, um, Sarkas, Viverin, Tangreen, Ukio, Vrathkri. Lots of planets where some of the worlds, uh, where the species are going to come from. Zafel, Yaga Minor. But the most important one is Wayland and Mount Tantis. Now, Wayland and Mount Tantis have cropped up again recently, being featured in the final episode of the Bad Batch series, as it's where they seem to be moving cloning to. Which, since the uh, Thrawn trilogy is all about cloning, really makes a lot of sense for them to show the cloning technology getting moved from... Um, oh, can't think of the world where it starts off. The Water World. But where the Bad Batch start off with and all the clones are created, but the Empire wants to move the cloning away from there to somewhere more under its control. So they have created Mount Tantis. Now we go through and it talks about the installation and all the levels of it, from the Emperor's chambers, the upper vaults, his private areas, the middle levels. We've got views of the Sparty Cylinders. One of the things that the Thrawn trilogy introduces, which I'm afraid the prequels totally destroys, is that cloning was always possible. But what Thrawn finds out is that you can speed it up and grow uh, clones a lot faster if you use the Salamiri, which cut off from the Force. And it's the Force's relationship to the clones, because they're unnaturally being grown, then the Force kind of imposes nature on them and kills them. But the Salamiri force the Force away, if that sounds right, and allow the clones to rapidly grow. Um, without that, they go insane. Uh, so we've got the Emperor's Throne Room there, a cutaway somatic of Mount Tantis, detailing over different areas. Um, little short stories in here, detailing what's going on, but really we're filling in the areas throughout the book. Apologies, paused the, paused the recording there, so I could have a good old cough and sneeze. This cold is killing me. Anyway, so we've got the labyrinth below and detailing the final area. Then we're on to creatures. Now, this is where the source book falls apart a bit for me, because I don't think it's as well thought out as it could be. For example, the Asalamiri. In the book, they are detailed as pushing the force away. So Jedi powers do not work. And I can accept that means that not only can Jedi not use their force powers, but they can't use, and nobody can use force points. The force is absent from that. However, when you read through the detail of their force repulsion here, characters cannot use force skills, force points, or character points. Well, I thought the way character points were in the game was they show learning from the character. So you can spend them on increasing your skills, or you can use them in play to show that your characters learn a way out of a problem, so they can roll an extra dice on something. There's nothing to do with the Force in there. It's all down to things that your character has learned. But Yisalamiri apparently stopped that. Meh, not happy with that. We've also got various other creatures here. The Vornskur, the big hunting creatures which Force sense so can hunt Jedi more easily. Clawbirds, Garrel. And then we're on to the aliens. Now, my big criticism of the last book was that the alien species in it were way too powerful. And this book does suffer from that, but they seem to have com overcompensated backwards as well. So we've got, for example, here, the Fargal. They have 12 attribute dice. They get teeth, which add two dice to their brawling damage, claws, which add one dice to brawling damage, a prehensile tail, which they can use as an extra arm at one dice minus one dice plus one to their dexterity. They get acrobatics and plus 2d to acrobatics. They're con artists, so they get a plus 2d bonus to con. So that's pretty advantageous. Not only are you getting a decent array of skills, you're not as great on technical or mechanical, but they can be considered dump stats sometimes. 
You can have a higher dexterity, so you can shoot and dodge pretty well. A higher perception, so you can dodge really well. Uh, sorry, go first in combat really well and spot enemies. You've got the standard amount of attribute dice, plus you get all these bonuses. That's pretty powerful. Flivians. Again, you're getting some nice advantages here. Um, two dice for every one you place in technical skills. You've got a stamina, plus 2D stamina. Um, they've got Fear of the Empire. They've got Curiosity. So they must make a moderate willpower roll at minus 1D penalty. They're unable to prevent themselves from examining a new device. Okay, that seems to balance things out. But they only get 10 attribute dice. So they're two dice worse than the Fargal. We've got the Zafel, who are basically humans. They get mechanical aptitude. They're corporate slaves. But they only get nine dice. They're three dice down on starting from other human species for getting two dice for every technical skill or mechanical skill a character creation. That's not great. In fact, it's not every. It's just starship or starship repair skills. So they get really badly penalised. The Marissi here get a teaching ability where vast majority of Marissi are scholars and should have them a scholar skill and a specialization. They can advance all specializations of scholar skill at half the normal character point cost. They're also known as slaves and they only get seven attribute dice. They are absolutely terrible species to start play as. And then we flip over and we've got the Sarkans. They've got the 12 dice. They've got night vision. They're cold blooded. Um, they've got a tail which do plus three strength plus plus three damage. Already starting with one pip higher strength than a Wookiee. So they can essentially be doing nine dice plus one damage with their tail. That's pretty much higher than any weapon apart from a lightsaber. Any character portable weapon. And they've got it attached to them, so they can never be disarmed. Um, they have a code of conduct that they must follow. But that's a role-playing thing. Plus, they are pretty slow. But they've got a massive advantage. They seem to have overcompensated with some species by taking off the attribute dice to balance abilities. And in others, they've just piled on the special abilities. But anyway, the Vath Kree. Uh, 12 attribute dice, a normal natural body armor. Strength plus 2 dice against physical attacks and strength plus 1 dice against in energy attacks. They're the same as storm Stormtrooper armor. Um, they're not particularly strong though. 4 dice plus 2, it's a bit stronger than a human. But that's a wonderful advantage to have. Um, Wustoids, Yagai, who get nothing particularly special. Um, Yaga drones, Zihibretha, who get to spray a stinging poison. Now that's a nice ability to get extra, makes your species interesting and different, without being unbalancing like some of these abilities are, and without giving you virtually no attribute dice. Can you imagine starting with only seven attribute dice? That's one in each attribute plus one dice extra to scatter around. They're going to be absolutely rubbish species. Then we're on to the Nogri. So we detail their world. Now the Nogri were shown, especially the Nogri Ruch. If I flip over a couple of pages, there he is, Ruch. They were introduced in the Rebels series. And while I adore the Rebels series, I think it's one of the best Star Wars things to have come out. I really did love it. I think putting the Nogri in it were a terrible idea because it's way before Thrawn should have met them. The way the Nogri are set up in these novels is they were a species which honoured strong combat. So stormtroopers turned up to enslave them and the Nogri slaughtered them. And then Darth Vader stepped onto the battlefield and humbled the entire species. So they swore themselves to him, not to the Emperor, not to the Empire, but to Darth Vader. So when Thrawn turns up later and goes, hey, the rebels have killed Vader and they've humbled his uh, memory, then the Nogri are like, we'll fight for you. We'll avenge our Lord. 
But then they catch the scent of Leia and recognize her as being Darth Vader's daughter and start following her as the Lady Vader, turning on Thrawn and eventually and Rook kills him. And that's a lovely storyline. But for Rook to have been with Thrawn during the Rebels series totally destroys that. It makes no sense whatsoever. So the Nogri background is completely different, I guess in the Disney timeline than it was in the original. I'm not usually one to criticise the changes Disney has made, because I'm not an absolute massive fan of the expanded universe. I tended to find it was a bit ridiculous super weapons, especially when they brought in the, uh, what was it called, the Sun Crusher, a starfighter that could blow up suns. You know, why bother with Death Stars if you can field a bunch of Starfighters with indestructible hulls which can blow up suns. Anyway, we've got other Nogri there. We're on to the equipment and droid section. So jammer packs, lock breakers, hollow recording macro monoculars, e-web repeating blasters, conner nets for disabling ships, portable missile launchers, and then we've got a few droids here, or only one, uh, general maintenance type. Some speeder trucks, which is fairly useful. A combat cloud car. And then we're on to the Starship section, where we've got the Golan 2 Space Defense Station, Golan 3, which are really nice to have. Basically, these are the things that the Empire used to defend planets, instead of putting a Star Destroyer on service around all the time. They are basically an immobile Star Destroyer. We've got Assault Shuttles, Mazix Battlecraft, um, a couple of... Preybird Starfighters. I think the Preybirds were first introduced in the X-Wing game, so it was nice to see actual stats for them. Got the New Republic Shroud Freighter, which is a Gatrock 720 freighter with Luke's X-Wing hidden inside. So when a tractor beam catches onto it, the hull falls open, the X-Wing soars away, and the pilot is free. Um, Lady Sunfire and updates to second edition of the Golden One Space Defense Station out of the first of the Thorn books. Um, afterward, detailing what happens to the Empire after the books and what happens to the New Republic after the books. Although this is very, very early on because they really didn't know there were going to be dozens and dozens more books. And it mentions a time of peace may finally be upon us. No, no, it's not. There's going to be absolutely loads of problems. Um, up to the Yutsat Vong eventually invading. And then we've got some adverts at the back. The Masterbook uh, system, which I've covered before. The Indiana Jones version, which covers Masterbook. And Blood Shadows, our Masterbook game. And that is the Last Command Sourcebook. Um, I hope you'll pardon me being a bit under the weather. My voice is really quite going now, and I'm really getting quite nasally. But I hope I've covered this in detail. It's a great source book, although it is flawed, in my opinion. I'm sure lots of people would disagree me in, with me in the comments. I hope that some will agree with me as well. So that was the last command source book for the Star Wars role-playing game. And with it being removed from the poll, we've created a space and we've added the Inquisitor's Handbook for Dark Heresy. Now, I had owned Dark Heresy since it came out, and I also bought this source book at the time, but neither of them really caught my attention when they came out. And recently, when I did a retro RPG on Dark Heresy, I absolutely loved it. So I'm really looking forward to covering this one. Hopefully it does well in the poll, but I think there's going to be other things still in there from the Klingon Ship Recognition Manual, the Rigger Black Book, the Arms and Equipment Guide, and Lunar Rising which people are going to prefer this week. But hopefully in a couple of weeks we're going to get the Inquisitor Handbook. So I think as usual I've put it on for quite long enough. So thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.